Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Sizing and Configuring Vertica in EON Mode for Different Use Cases. I'm Jeff Healy, and I lead Vertica Marketing. I'll be your host for this breakout session. Joining me are Sumit Kazwani and Triran Kamat, Vertica Product Technology Engineers and key leads on the Vertica Customer Success team. But before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, visit Vertica Forums at forum.vertica.com. Post your question there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, as a reminder, that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. Now let's get started. Over to you, Sriran. Thanks, Jeff. So for today's presentation, we have picked Eon Mode concepts. We are going to go over sizing, sizing guidelines for Eon Mode, some of the use cases that you can benefit from using Eon Mode. And last, at last, we are going to talk about uh, you know, some tics, uh, tips and tricks that can help you, uh, you know, configure and manage your, your cluster. Okay, so as you know, uh, Vertica has two modes of operation, Eon Mode and Enterprise Mode. So the question that you may have is, which mode should I implement? So let's look at what's there in the enterprise mode. Enterprise mode, you have you know, an, a cluster with general purpose compute nodes uh, that have locally attached storage. Because of this tight integration of compute and storage, you get fast and reliable performance all the time. Now, the amount of data that you can store in enterprise mode cluster depends on the total disk capacity of the cluster. Again, Enterprise mode is more suitable for on-premise and cloud deployment. Now, let's look at Eon mode. To take advantage of cloud economics, Vertica implemented Eon mode, which is getting very popular among our customers. In Eon mode, we have compute and storage, uh, which is that are separated by introducing S3 bucket or you know, S3 compliant storage. Now, because of this separation of compute and storage, uh, you can take advantages like uh, massive uh, or dynamic scale out and scaling uh, isolation of your workload, as well as you can load data in your cluster without having to worry about uh, the total disk capacity of your local nodes. As obviously, a, you know, it's obvious from what they have said, uh, Eon mode is suitable for cloud deployment. Some of our customers will you know, take advantage of the features of Eon mode are also deploying it in premise by introducing S3 compliant flash blade storage. Okay. So let's look at some of the terminologies used in Eon mode. The four things that I want to talk about are communal storage. It's a shared storage uh, or S3 compliant shared storage or a bucket that is accessible from all the nodes in your cluster. Shard is a segment of data stored on a community storage. Subscription, it's a binding between nodes and shards. And last, depot. Depot is a local copy or a local cache that can help query uh, improve performance. So shard is a segment of data stored in communal storage. When you, when you create a yarn more cluster, you have to specify the shard count. Shard counts decide the maximum number of nodes that will participate in your query. So Vertica also will introduce a shard called replica shard that will hold the data for replicated projections. Okay. Subscription, as I said before, is a binding between nodes and shards. Each node 
subscribes to one or more shards, and a shard has uh, at least two nodes that subscribe to it for case safety. Subscribing nodes are responsible for writing and reading from shard data. Also, subscriber node holds uh, up-to-date metadata for a catalog of files that are present in the shard. So when you connect to Vertica node, Vertica will automatically assign you a set of nodes and subscriptions that will process your query. There are two important system tables. There are node subscription and session subscription that can help you, uh, you know, understand this a little bit more. So let's look at what's on the local disk of your Yarn Mode cluster. So on local disk, you have Depot. Depot is a local file system cache that can hold subset of the data or a copy of the data in communal storage. Other things that are there are temp storage. Temp storage is used for storing data belonging to temporary tables and the data that spills to this uh, when you're processing queries. The last is catalog. Catalog is a, there is a persistent copy of Vertica catalog that is written to this. The, the writes happen at every commit. We only read this persistent copy at node startup. There is also a copy of Vertica catalog stored in communal storage for durability. The local copy is synced to the copy in communal storage uh, via service, you know, you know, at in the interval of five minutes. So let's look at Depot. Now, as I said before, Depot is your file system cache. It helps to reduce network traffic and improve performance of your queries. So we make assumption that when you load data in Vertica, that's the data that you may most frequently query. So every data that is loaded in Vertica is first entering the depot, and then as a part of same transaction, also sync to communal storage for durability. So when you query, when you run a query against Vertica, your queries are also going to find the files in the depot first to be used. And if the files are not found, you know, the queries will access files from communal storage. Now, the behavior of, you know, the, whether the new files should first enter the depot or skip depot can be changed by configuration parameters that can help you skip depot when writing. Okay? When the files are not found in depot, we make assumption that you may need those files for future runs of your queries, which means we will fetch them asynchronously into the depot so that you have those files for future runs. If that's not the behavior that you intend, you can change configuration parameter to tell Vertica to not fetch them when you run your queries. And this configuration parameter can be set at database level, session level, query level, and we are also introducing a user level parameter where you can change this behavior. Because the depot is going to be limited in size as compared to amount of data that you may store in your Elon cluster, at some point in time, your depot will be full or hit the capacity. To make space for new data that is coming in, Vertica will elect some of the files that are least recently used, okay? As Depot is going to be your perform query performance enhancer, you want to shape the content of your Depot, right? And so what you want to do is to decide what should be in your Depot. Now, Vertica provides some of the policies called pinning policies that can help you pin a specific table or a partition of a table into uh, the depot uh, at subcluster level 
or at the database level. And Sumit will talk about this a little bit more in his future slides. Now, look at some of the system tables that can, you know, help you understand about the size of the depot, about, you know, what's in your depot, uh, what files were evicted, what files were recently fetched into the depot. One of the important system tables that I have listed here is DC file rate. DC file rate can be used to figure out if your transaction or a query fetched its data from depot, from communal storage, or from both. Okay. One of the important uh, feature of Eon mode is a subcluster. Vertica lets you divide your cluster into smaller execution groups. Now, each of the execution group has set of nodes together subscribed to all the shards and can process your query independently. So when you connect to a node in the subcluster, that node along with other nodes in the subcluster will only process your query. And because of that, we can achieve isolation as well as, you know, uh, achieve scale out and scaling without impacting what's happening on the cluster. The good thing about uh, subcluster is all the subclusters have access and have access to the common, you know, common communal storage. And because of which, if you load data in one subcluster, it's accessible to, you know, the queries that are running in other subclusters. When we introduced subclusters, we knew that our customers would really love these features. And, you know, some of the things that we were considering is we knew that our customers would, you know, uh, dynamically scale out and in uh, uh, lots of, uh, that means add and remove lots of subclusters on demand. And we had to uh, provide, this, you know, we had to give this feature uh, or provide ability to add and remove subclusters uh, in a fast and reliable way. We knew that uh, during off-peak hours, our customers would shut down many of their subclusters. That means more than half of the nodes could be down. Uh, and, and we had to make adjustment to our quorum policy, which requires at least half of the nodes to be up for database to stay up. We also uh, were aware that customers would add hundreds of nodes in the cluster, which means we had to make adjustments to the catalog and commit policy. To take care of all these three requirements, we introduce two types of subclusters, primary subcluster and secondary subcluster. Primary subcluster is a one that you get by default when you create your first Eon cluster. Uh, the nodes in the primary subclusters are always up, that means they stay up and participate in the quorum. The nodes in the primary subcluster are responsible for processing commits and also maintain a persistent copy of catalog on disk. This is a subcluster that you would use to process all your ETL jobs because the tuple mover also runs on the node in the primary subcluster. If you want now at this point, have another subcluster where you would like to run queries and also uh, bring this cluster up and down depending on uh, the demand or the, you know, depending on the workload, you would, you know, create a new subcluster and this subcluster will be of type secondary in nature. Now, secondary subclusters uh, have nodes that don't participate in quorum. So if these nodes are down, Vertica has no impact. These nodes are also not responsible for processing commit, though they maintain uh, up-to-date copy of the catalog in memory. They don't store catalog on disk. And these are subclusters that you can add and remove uh, very quickly without impacting what is running on the other subclusters. We have customers running you know, hundreds of nodes 
a cluster with hundreds of nodes and subclusters of sizes like 64 nodes. And they can bring this up, subcluster up and down or add and remove within a few minutes. Okay. So before I go into the sizing of your node, I just want to say one more thing here. Uh, we are working very closely with some of our customers who are running here on mode and getting, a, getting feedback from them on a regular basis. And based on the feedback, we are making lots of improvements and fixes in every hot fix that we put out. So if you are running Eon mode and want to be part of this group, uh, I suggest that you, you keep your cluster current with the latest hot fixes and work with us to give us feedback and get the improvements that you need to be successful. So let's look at what there in the what 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 we need to size the eon cluster. Sizing eon cluster is very different from sizing enterprise mode cluster. When you're running an enterprise mode cluster or when you're sizing a vertical cluster running enterprise mode, uh, you need to uh, take into account the amount of data that you want to store and the configuration of your node. Depending on which you decide how many nodes you would need and then start the cluster. Whereas in your mode, you, to size a cluster, you would need few things like what should be your shard count. Now, shard count decides the maximum number of nodes that will participate in your query. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide. You will decide on number of nodes that you will need within a subcluster, the instance type you would pick for running uh, a specific subcluster, and how many subclusters you will need, and how many of them should be running all the time, and how many should be running you know, in a dynamic mode. So when it comes to shard count, you have to pick shard uh, count up front, and you can't change it, you know, once you have picked it and your database is up and running. So, we, so you need to pick shard count depending on uh, the number of nodes or maximum number of nodes that you need to process the query. Now, one thing that we want to remember here is this is not amount of data that you have in database, but this is amount of data your queries will process. So you may have data for six years, but if your queries process last month of data on most of the occasions, or if your dashboards are processing uh, you know, up to like six weeks or you know, 10 minutes based on whatever your needs are, you will decide or pick the number of shards, you know, shard counts and nodes based on how much data your queries process. Looking at most of our customers, we think that 12 is a good number that should work for most of our customers. And that means the maximum number of nodes in the subcluster that will process query is going to be 12. Uh, you, if, you, if you feel that uh, you need more than 12 nodes to process your query, you can pick other numbers like 24 or 48. If you pick a higher number, like 48, and you go with three nodes in your subcluster, that means the node subscribes to uh, you know, 16 primary and 16 secondary shards subscriptions, uh, which totals to 32 subscriptions per node. That will leave uh, your catalog in a bloated state. So pick shard count appropriately, don't pick prime numbers. We suggest 12 should work for most of our customers. If you think you process more than, uh, you know, the regular, uh, you know, regular number that, or you, you think that your customer, I mean, you think your queries process terabytes of data, then pick a number like 24. Don't pick a prime number, okay? We are also coming up with features in vertical like grunt scaling that will help you run more query, you know, run queries 
on more than more nodes than the number of shards that you pick. And that feature will be coming out soon. So if you have picked a smaller shard count, uh, it's not the end of the story. Now, the next thing is you need to pick how many nodes you need uh, you know, within your subclusters to process your query. Um, ideal number would be node, you know, node numbers equal to shard count, or uh, if you're going to pick a number that is less, pick node count, which is such that each of the nodes has a balanced uh, distribution of subscriptions. Okay. When, so over here, you can have an uh, option where you can have 12 nodes and 12 shards, or you can have two subclusters with six nodes and 12 shards. Depending on your workload, you can pick either of the two options. The first option where you have 12 nodes and 12 shards is more suitable for, uh, more suitable for batch applications, whereas two subclusters with, uh, with you know, six nodes each uh, is more suitable for dashboard type application. Picking subclusters is, you know, it depends on your workload. Uh, you can add remote nodes to achieve isolation or elastic throughput scaling. Uh, you know, your subclusters can have nodes of different sizes, and uh, you need to make sure that the nodes within the subcluster have to be homogeneous. So this is my last slide before I hand over to Sumit. And this, I think, is a very important slide that I want you to pay attention to. When you pick instance, you're going to pick instance based on workload and query budget. I want to make it clear here that we want you to pay attention to the local disk because you have depot on your local disk, which is going to be your query performance enhancer for all kinds of deployments in cloud as well as on premise. So irrespective of what you read or what you heard, depots still play a very important role in every Eon deployments, and uh, they act like a performance enhancers. Most of our customers choose Vertica because they love the performance we offer, and we don't want you to compromise on the performance. So pick nodes with some amount of local disk. At least two terabytes is what, is what we suggest. I3 instances in Amazon have, you know, come up with a good local disk that is very helpful and some of our customers are benefiting from. With that said, I want to pass it over to Sumit. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Sumit Teswani and I'm a product technology engineer at Vertica. Uh, I will be discussing um, the various use cases that uh, customers deploy in Eon Node. After that, I will go into some technical details of SQL, uh, and then I'll blend that into the best practices um, in Eon Node. And finally, uh, we'll go to uh, some tips and tricks. So let's get started with the use cases. So the very basic use case um, that uh, users will um, um, encounter when they start um, Eon mode the first time is they'll have two subclusters. The first subcluster will be the primary subcluster uh, used for ETL, like Sri Rang mentioned. And this cluster, subcluster will be mostly on or always on. There will be another subcluster used for purely for queries. And this subcluster is the secondary subcluster, and it will be on sometimes, um, depending on the use case maybe from 9 to 5 or Monday to Friday, depending on what you know application is running on it or what users are doing on it. So this is the most basic use case, um, something that users get started with to get their feet wet. Now, as the use of the, of the deployment or, or Eon Mode Vertica cluster increases, uh, the users will graduate into the second use case. And, and this is the next level of deployment. 
Uh, in this situation, you know, they still have the primary subcluster, which is used for ETL. You know, typically a larger, larger subcluster where there's more heavier ETL um, running pretty much uh, nonstop. Then they have their usual query subcluster, which was used for queries, uh, but they may add another one, another um, secondary subcluster for ad hoc workloads. The, the motivation for this um, subcluster is to isolate um, the unpredictable workload from the predictable workload, so as not to impact um, certain SLAs. So you may have uh, you know, ad hoc queries or, or users that are running larger queries or batch workloads that occur once in a while from running on a secondary subcluster, um, on a different secondary subcluster, so as to not impact the uh, more predictable workload running on the first subcluster. Now, there is no reason why these two subclusters need to have the same instance types. They can have different number of nodes, different instance types, different depot configurations, uh, and, and everything can be different. Another benefit is they can be metered differently. They can be costed differently so that you know, the appropriate user or tenant can be um, build the, the cost of compute. Um, now, as the use increases even further, uh, this is what we see as you know, the final state of a very advanced EON mode deployment here. As you'll see, there is the primary subcluster, of course, used for ETL. Uh, very heavy ETL, and it's always on. There are numerous secondary subclusters, um, some for predictable um, applications that have a very uh, fine-tuned workload that needs uh, a definite performance. There are other subclusters that have different usages, uh, some for ad hoc queries, uh, others for demanding tenants. Uh, there could be still more subclusters for different departments like Finance that needed, um, you know, maybe at the end of the quarter. Um, so very, very different applications, and this is uh, the full and final um, uh, promise of Eon, where there is workload isolation, there is there is different metering, and each app runs in its own compute space. Okay, so let's um, let's talk about a, a very interesting feature in Eon mode, which we call Hibernate and Revive. So what is hibernating? Hibernating the Vertica database is the act of dissociating all the computers on the database and shutting it down. Uh, at this point, you you shut down all compute. You still need for storage because your data is in the S3 bucket, but all the compute has been shut down and you do not pay for compute anymore. Uh, if you have reserved instances or any other instances, you can use them for uh, a different application and your Vertica database is shut down. So this is uh, very similar to stop database in EE mode, uh, you're stopping all compute. Uh, the benefit of course being is you pay nothing anymore for compute. Uh, so what is revive then? Well, the revive is the opposite of hibernate where you now associate compute with your S3 bucket or your storage and start up the database. Um, there is one limitation here that you should be aware of is that the, the size of the database that you, that you have during Hibernate, you must revive with the same size. So if you have a 12 node uh, primary subcluster when um, hibernating, you need to provision 12 nodes in order to revive. So, so one best practice comes out of this is that you must shrink your database to the smallest size possible before you hibernate so that you can revive it in the same size and you don't have to you know, uh, spin up a ton of compute in order to revive. Um, so basically, what this means is, uh, when you are when you have decided to hibernate, we ask you to you know uh, remove all your secondary subclusters and shrink your primary subcluster down to the bare minimum before you uh, hibernate it. And the benefit being is when you do revive, you will have um, you will be able to do so with a minimal number of nodes. And of course, uh, before you uh, hibernate, you must cleanly shut down the database so that all the data can be synced to S3. Uh, finally, uh, let's talk about uh, backups and uh, replication. Uh, backups and replications are still supported in Eon mode. Um, we sometimes get the question, you know, we're in S3 and S3 has nine lines of reliability. Do we need a backup? Uh, yes, we highly recommend backups. Um, you can back up by um, using the VBR script. You can back up your database to another bucket. You can also copy the bucket and revive uh, 
to a different uh, derive a different instance of your of your database. So this is very useful um, because uh, many times people want staging or development databases and they need some of the data from production and this is a nice way to uh, get that. And it also makes sure that if you accidentally delete something, you will uh, be able to uh, get back your data. Okay, so let's uh, let's go into best practices now. Um, I will start. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, the depot first, which is the biggest performance enhancer um, um, that 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 we see for queries. So um, I want to uh, I want to say very clearly that you know reading from S3 or a, or a remote object store like S3 is very slow because data has to go over the network and it's very expensive and you will pay for access costs. Um, this is where S3 uh, you know is not very cheap is that every time you access the data um, there is an API and access cost levied. Now the depot is a performance enhancing feature that will improve the performance of queries by keeping a local cache of the data that is most frequently used. It will also reduce the cost of accessing the data because you no longer have to go to the remote object store to get the data since it's available on a local ephemeral volume. Hence, depot shipping is a very important aspect of uh, performance tuning in a NEON database. Uh, what we ask you to do is, you know, if you are going to use a specific table or partition frequently, you can choose to pin it in the depot so that you know if your depot is uh, under pressure or is highly utilized these objects that are most frequently used are kept in the depot um, so therefore depot uh, um, depot shaping is the act of setting an eviction policy so it's that you prevent the eviction of uh, the files that you believe you need to keep so for example you may keep the most recent years data or the most recent um, recent partition in, in the depot, and thereby all queries running on those partitions will be faster. Uh, at this time, we allow you to pin any table or partition um, in the depot, but it is not subcluster based. Uh, future versions of uh, Vertica will allow you fine tuning the depot based on each subcluster. So uh, let's now go uh, and understand a little bit of um, internals of how a SQL query works in Eon mode. And uh, once I explain this, we will blend into best practice and it will become much more clearer why we recommend certain things. So since S3 is our layer of durability, uh, where data is persisted in an Eon database, uh, when you run an insert query like, you know, insert into table value one or something similar, uh, data is synchronously written into S3. So before the control returns back to the client, the, the copy of the data is first stored in the local depot and then uploaded to S3. And only then do we hand the control back to the client. Uh, this ensures that you know if something bad were to happen, uh, the data would be persistent. The second, uh, the second type of SQL transactions are what we call DDLs, which are catalog uh, operations. So for example, you created a table or you added a column. Uh, these operations are actually working with metadata. Now, as you may know, S3 does not offer mutable storage. So storage in S3 is immutable. Uh, you can never append to a file in S3. And um, the way transaction logs work is they are, they are append operations. So when you, uh, when you modify the metadata, you are actually appending to a transaction log. Um, so this poses an interesting challenge, which we resolve by appending to the transaction log locally in the catalog. And then there's a service that syncs the catalog to S3 every five minutes. So this uh, poses an interesting challenge, right? If you were to destroy or delete an instance abruptly, uh, you could lose the commits that were that happened in the last five minutes. Um, and I'll speak to this more um, in in the, in the subsequent slide. Now, finally, let's uh, look at um, uh, drops or truncates in the envelope. Now, a drop or a truncate is really a combination of the first two things that we spoke about. When you drop a table, 
you are making a catalog operation, you're making a metadata change. You are telling Vertica that this table no longer exists. So we go into the transaction log and append into the transaction log uh, that this table has been removed. This log, of course, will be uh, synced every five minutes to S3, like we spoke. There is also the secondary operation of deleting all the files that were associated with data in this table. Now, these files are on S3. And we can go about deleting them synchronously, but that would take a lot of time. And we do not want to hold up the client for this duration. So at this point, we do not synchronously delete the files. We put the files that need to be removed in a Reaper queue. And we return the control back to the client. And this has a performance benefit as to the drops appear to occur really fast. Uh, this also has a cost benefit. Um, you know, batching deletes in big batches is more is more performant and less costly. Uh, for example, on Amazon, you could delete 1,000 files at a time in a single call. Uh, so if you batched your deletes, um, you could delete them fairly quickly. The, the, the disadvantage of this is if you were to terminate a vertical cluster abruptly, you could leak files in S3 because the Reaper queue would not have had the chance to delete these files. Okay, so let's um, let's um, go into best practices uh, after speaking, uh, after understanding some technical details. So as I said, a reading and writing to S3 is slow and costly. So the first thing you can do is avoid as many round trips to S3 as possible. The bigger batches of data you load, the better. The better performance you get per, per commit. The second thing is don't read and write from S3 if you can avoid it. A lot of our customers have uh, intermediate data processing, like staging tables where they will transform the data before finally committing it. Uh, there is no reason to use uh, regular tables for this kind of intermediate data. We recommend using local temporary tables, uh, and local temporary tables have the benefit of not having to upload data to S3. Um, finally, um, there is another um, um, optimization you can make. Um, Vertica has the concept of active partitions and inactive partitions. Active partitions are the ones where you have recently loaded data, and Vertica is lazy about merging these um, partitions into a single ROS container. Inactive partitions are historical partitions, like consider you know, last year's data or the year before that, uh, that data. Those partitions are aggressively merged into a single container. And how do we know how many partitions are active and inactive? Well, that's based on a configuration parameter. Um, if you load into an inactive partition, Vertica is very aggressive about merging these containers. So we download the entire partition, merge the records that you uh, loaded into it, and upload it back again. Um, this creates a lot of um, network traffic. And as I said, you know, accessing data is uh, from S3 is slow and costly. So we, so we recommend you not load into inactive partitions. Uh, you should load into the most recent or active partitions. And if you happen to load into inactive partitions, set your part active partition to count correctly. OK, let's talk about the, uh, the Reaper queue. Um, depending on the velocity of your ETL, you can pile up a lot of files that need to be deleted asynchronously. Um, if you were to terminate a vertical cluster without allowing enough time for these uh, files to get deleted, um, you could leak files in S3. Now, uh, of course, if you use local temporary tables, this, this problem does not occur because the files were never created in S3. But, but if you are using regular tables, uh, you must allow Vertica enough time to delete these files. And you can, say, you can uh, change the, you know, the interval at which we delete and how much time we allowed to delete extra down by setting some configuration parameters that I have mentioned here. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the catalog at this point. So the catalog is synced every five minutes onto S3 for persistence. And the catalog truncation version is the minimal minimal viable version of the catalog to which we can revive. So for for instance, if somebody destroyed your vertical cluster, uh, the entire vertical cluster, um, the catalog truncation version is the minimum minimum viable version that you will be able to revive. Now, um, in order to make sure that the catalog truncation version is up to date, you must always shut down your vertical cluster cleanly. 
Uh, this allows the catalog to be uh, synced to uh, S3. Uh, here are some um, SQL commands that you can use to see what the con catalog configuration version is on S3. Uh, for the most part, you don't have to worry about this if you're shutting down TV. So uh, this is only in cases of you know disaster or some event where you know all nodes were terminated without uh, without um, you know the user's uh, permission. And um, Yeah, and finally, let's uh, let's talk about backups so one more time. Um, we highly recommend you take backups. Um, you know, M S3 is designed for 99.9% .9 availability, so there there could be and maybe an occasional downtime. Um, making sure you have backups will help you if you accidentally drop a table. Um, you know, S3 will not protect you against data that was deleted by accident. So you know, having um, a backup helps you there. Uh, and why not backup, right? Storage is cheap. You can replicate the entire bucket and have that as a backup or or have a DR cluster running in a different region, which also serves as a backup. So um, we highly recommend you make backups. Um, so, um, so with this, I would like to, um, you know, um, uh, end my presentation, and we're ready for any questions um, if you have it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>